and I, it is my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Tiffany Strever is currently our program tra uh, trauma program manager at Abraza West Campus. She graduated with her associate's degree in nursing in 1985 and went on to obtain her bachelor's in nursing in 2004. She spent the last 25 years in emergency critical care nursing with the last 20 years at level one trauma centers here, uh, most of it in the valley, but uh, some in the Midwest. Tiffany's uh, published uh, in the Journal of Emergency Nursing and authored chapters in Emergency Nursing Pediatric Course and the Trauma Nursing Core Course. Uh, she has her certification in Emergency Nursing and was recently accepted into the Academy of Emergency Nursing as a fellow, which is quite a, quite a, a feat if you uh, follow that uh, line. She is active in the Emergency Nurses Association and has served at the local, state, and national level in many capacities and currently sits on the National Board of Directors for the ENA. In addition to her full-time role as a trauma program manager, my trauma program manager, uh, she's also a lieutenant colonel in the Arizona Air National Guard, uh, and she has been deployed. Uh, so with Veterans Day being yesterday, I definitely want to give her a little <laughs> kudos for that. Uh, and most recently, she, uh, she was uh, awarded the 2015 March of Dimes Distinguished Nurse of the Year, uh, which is quite a feat, and we're very proud of her. Uh, so please uh, give Tiffany a very warm round of applause as she speaks to us today. Well, good morning. Thank you to the Trauma Association for having me speak. Um, being the first nurse of the day is a little bit stressful. <laughs> Not that I haven't been you can do it. doing this for 30 years. Um, so I am going to talk about OB trauma. First of all, I am not an OB nurse. I am a trauma ED nurse. But I did have four kids, so I guess maybe some of this makes sense now why I felt so yucky for a couple, three months along the line. So that's my disclosure. So we're going to talk about unique pathophysiological changes related to the pregnant patient because I think it's important um, that we understand what makes that pregnant patient different. And then we're going to define assessments and intervention priorities related to that pregnant patient. I do have lots of statistics and lots of data, so I am going to use my notes um, periodically throughout this because, like I said, I am not an OB nurse. I am a ED nurse. But I did want to start off with a case study. This is a generic case study, made it up just from all the years of, of doing trauma. But the reason I wanted to start with the case study was to kind of get you thinking with the questions I've listed here as we go through the lecture and talk about the changes and the differences that we see with the pregnant patient. And then we'll go back to this at the end and hopefully some of these um, question, or some of this will make a little more sense. So we start off with a 36-week pregnant female involved in a motor vehicle crash. Heart rate is 115, blood pressure is 92 over 60, respiratory rate is 26. She's complaining of abdominal pain, and she states that she was restrained, or EMS tells us she was restrained. We're going to get to that later in the lecture and what we want to know about that. Um, so here's some of the questions. Is the abdominal pain a concern? Any additional details related to the pregnancy that we may want to know? And any additional details, like I said, about the crash itself or the restraints that, was, that were in place? So when we look at epidemiology, trauma is the leading non-obstetrical cause of death. Um, and, and we see um, it's complicated about 7% of all pregnancies. And interestingly enough, when we look at those um, trauma-related injuries, they will actually cause death in about 6 to 7% of the mothers. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot, 
But if we're thinking about the dynamics related to trauma and pregnancy, not only in most cases do we lose the mother, but as you'll see when we get into talking about fetal demise, that will lose the fetus too. So the family is going through not only the, lo the loss of one person, but ultimately two. Um, prime time for trauma and pregnancy is actually the third trimester, probably related to the big old belly that they're sporting. But um, what I found was interesting when I was looking at the literature, most of the mo trauma that occurs is minor. And because of the changes, it also appears to improve the chance of survival. Not sure why, just maybe because of the, some of the changes that occur to the pregnant female um, that make her handle it better, but it was interesting that, that there is a um, better chance of survival. However, it does alter the injury pattern. Um, probably, again, related to the big old belly they're sporting and some of the other things that we'll talk about. Motor vehicle crashes are the most common mechanism of injury, um, but we also have to think about falls. When you've got that protrudent abdomen, your center of balance certainly becomes unstable and they're more prone to falls um, because your center of balance changes. You'll see penetrating trauma, although it's not as common, um, it pretty much sticks out, you know, just like the, the non-pregnant patient, blunt trauma more common than your penetrating. But what I think is interesting, and always we always need to keep this in the back of our mind, these patients are at a higher risk for interpersonal violence. About 11% of our pregnant patients will be a victim of interpersonal violence. So when they come in, even if they come in for something other than that, we really need to, to do good screening and good intervention and in talking to these moms and finding out what their environment is because you know they may come in for a fall. Well, what was the action behind the fall? Did they have a help? All right, so there's a little bit of trivia on the next slide. We'll see if anybody knows who this is. Who is that? Okay, Gone with the Wind. Classic movie. This is Kizzy, and her classic line was, I don't know nothing about birth and babies. That is an ED nurse's top line. Cross your legs, breathe, get in the wheelchair, and let's see how fast we can make it to whatever floor OB is on, right? Don't want to birth any babies. Um, but when it comes to the trauma, the pregnant trauma patient, our priorities really do remain the same. We know that statistically speaking, that the best outcome for that baby is gonna be based on mom's outcome. But this is where we get into the pathophysiological changes that occur with mom that make her a little bit unique. When we look at airway, we know that um, the gastric sphincter relaxes and I once had an obese tell me that a pregnant stomach is always a full stomach, so they have delayed gastric emptying. So these patients are predisposed to throwing up, and some of us did it quite well at certain points in our pregnancies, and then aspiration, because if you think about it, now they've thrown up, in what way do they come in? They come in backboarded or collared, depending on how they come in, so they're laying on their back, so um, they do have that increased risk. Respiratorily wise, there's several changes that occur. They become, they actually function in a respiratory alkalosis. Um, so keep that in mind when you're looking at your blood gases later on. They become tachypnic. Their tidal volume or the amount of air that we move in and out of our lungs actually increases by about 40%. So we increase our tidal volume and our respiratory rate also increases. So with our increased respiratory rate, that's why we get our alkalosis that occurs. But our consumption of, of oxygen needs, and you'll notice I say we, because I've been one of those patients, um, increases by about 15 to 20% as well. So we increase our tidal volume, we increase our respiratory rate, but we increase our, increase our needs. Um, not only because 
we're oxygenating ourselves, but we're also oxygenating the fetus. So your glide gases will reflect a hyperventilation and a compensated respiratory alkalosis. So think about what traditionally happens to our trauma patients as they become acidotic. So oftentimes in your resuscitative processes, just correcting mom's acidosis if things are kind of heading south in a bad way will help um, improve the outcomes. High hypoxemia occurs more quickly and it is not tolerated. So definitely need, the pregnant patient needs that oxygen. Not only for her, but for her unborn child as well. The diaphragm is pushed up, which makes sense as we progress in the pregnancy. The abdomen, again, becomes more protrudent, so it kind of squishes everything up. The lungs shorten, so that affects our functional reserve. So our tidal volume goes up, but our reserve goes down. But also something to think about is chest tube placement because our lungs are shortened, so your chest tube placement, if that patient has a pneumothorax, may be affected as well. So think about that in, are we gonna go in our traditional position or are we gonna move it a little bit because of that? When we look at circulation, there is an increase in heart rate. They actually become hyperdynamic and hypervolemic. So they actually have more fluid volumes, so you'll actually see what we call an anemia of pregnancy. They increase their volume, but they don't increase the number of cells. So they will walk around with a normal lower hemoglobin and hematocrit. Heart rate increases about 10 to 15 beats, and they increase their cardiac output by about 1 to 1.5 liters, or about 35 to 50% above baseline. So again, they're really they're really efficient at what they're doing. They've got good cardiac output. They've got good volume on board. However, the uterus and the placenta take 20% of that volume. So we always talk about the pregnant brain because all our blood is in the uterus. While there's no literature out there to support it, I truly believe it. You know, we increase our blood volume, but 20% of it is lower than it should be. Blood pressure decreases 15 to 20% naturally. So they're going to have, if we think back to our case study, increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, lower blood pressure. Um, it'll generally return closer to normal in the third trimester, but the other thing we think about is that these people are normal, healthy, younger people. Generally, they're in their 20s and 30s. So vital signs are going to be, you know, maybe a little bit lower anyway as far as our blood pressure. Also due to hormonal changes, there's a natural vasodilatation that occurs in the pregnant patient. So they may not be cool and clammy. They may be kind of like that neurogenic shock patient that everybody wanted to do something for in the case study earlier. Um, and, I, and I already talked about that the blood volume increases and the blood pressure decreases. They also have a great compensatory mechanism. So they may actually lose 1,500 to 2,000 liters or more than 30% of their blood volume before you'll see a change in their vital signs, especially their blood pressure. Kind of reminds me of the pediatric patient, right? They compensate great and then they go south. So you will actually see changes in the fetus with about 15% of maternal blood loss. You'll see decelerations, you'll see lack of fetal movement, some of those things. So good assessment of your mom also includes good assessment of that fetus and making sure that baby is um, moving, that their heart rates are nor within normal um, for, for them because you'll see changes in them before you'll see changes in mom. All right. Full set of vitals, again, keeping in mind that the there is differences. And this is where we also include assessment of the fetus. We would think it would be in our primary assessment, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, all of that. Again, if our priorities remain the same and we're treating mom with oxygen, with you know fluids, then baby can wait a little bit. 
It also means getting those people that do babies down there. Um, when we have, you know, those are the first line. So assessment of the fundal height, assessment of the fetal heart tones, fetal heart tones normal, 120, 160, everything is good. We want to look at, um, you know, what that fundal height is, gives us a kind of a generalization of whether we're good for gestational age. Comfort. Considerations to the fetus. Okay, yeah, we need to consider if we're going to emergently see section mom in the trauma bay and we've given her a bunch of narcotic, how is it going to affect the baby? But we also have to consider that, we, that mom's in pain and we need to do a good assessment. Psychologically as well, making sure that we're talking to mom, making sure that we're providing comfort other than just narcotics because they're going to be worried about one thing and one thing only if they're awake and that's the baby. Um, history, keeping in mind when we're doing our head to toe, where our changes are at, you know, what's my fundal height supposed to be, um, but also this is where we start to get into history related to pregnancy. Is this their first pregnancy? Have they had issues with this pregnancy or previous pregnancies? Um, do they have pregnancy-induced hypertension? Because that's going to change things all the more. Who's their obstetrician? Have they had prenatal care? You know, not necessarily in the typical trauma patient, but if you've been in ED any length of time, that person that comes in with abdominal pain and you ask them if they're, gonna, if they're pregnant and they look at you like, I'm not pregnant, and you're like, well, you won't be in about five minutes. Don't understand it, never quite figured it out, but it truly happens and we just roll with it. Um, the one thing that I think we sometimes forget, how many babies are in there? You know, do they have one, two, six? Um, because that's going to affect how long we monitor mom. That's going to affect if we're crash C-section. That's going to be affecting the viability because, you know, we know that the more infants or fetuses we have, they're already set up for preterm labor, and they're already set up for being um, at risk for, for coming out with, with potential for issues. So, and, and in that piece of it as well, what are we going to do? If we've got a 32-weeker or a 28-weeker, are we going to keep that baby? Do we need to be on the phone with the facility to transfer them? And when we're looking at history, this, you know, how far did they fall? Were they a motor vehicle crash? And where was that seatbelt positioned? One of the things that we'll see with our, with our injuries is an improperly placed lap belt portion of it. They need to wear it low, and this is where we can help with, you know, when, if, if mom comes in and everything's fine, we discharge her home. Good injury prevention. Um, low underneath that abdomen. Because if you're going at a pretty good clip and that you're in a crash and that, abdo or that lap belt snaps across the abdomen, while you may not suffer injury, there actually is documented um, injuries to the fetus. So we want to make sure that we get that good history because mom may look fine, but babe may not be. So what are the common um, complications that we'll see with the pregnant patient? Well, premature labor occurs in about 25% of all pregnant patients that are involved in trauma. So it's a pretty significant, pretty commonly occurring. We see it, you know, it's defined as more than six contractions an hour. But again, go back to history. Has mom been having back Braxton Hicks? If so, how often do they occur? Are they occurring every day? Um, is this, you know, she goes through, it's three o'clock in the afternoon, and after she has the, you know, coffee from wherever, she always has contractions and the baby's doing the mamba. So get that good history. They may be in the back, and if that mom is a first time mom, she may not identify that the, what she, that pain that she's having consistently in her back is actually premature labor. Again, want to make sure we get our OBs involved. Vaginal bleeding may occur. Really, the treatment is to monitor these moms. 
monitor them, give them fluids. Um, oftentimes we'll see resolution of the premature labor with fluids and I actually did work labor and delivery three years, so, but that was way long before I became an ED nurse. Um, bed rest and then, you know, if it's not resolving, are we gonna give medications? What's the effect on mom? What's the gestational age of baby? How long do we wanna keep them? Do we wanna keep them in our facility? Do we wanna send them where they can hand, you know, have more resources? And are we gonna deliver? You know, this is 36 weeks and everything looks good and mom's stressed and we just need to do what we need to do. When we look at abruptive placenta, the placenta is really a friable, inelastic organ that serves as that, you know, passage for nutrients and oxygen and all that stuff between mom and babe. And it, it can easily be torn or sheared if you have any type of acceleration or deceleration injury. Um, while the mortality rate with a placental abruption is relatively low in mom, um, about, you know, relatively low, when we look at the fetal mortality rate, it can be upwards of 68%. So this is one of those things, mom's gonna be shocky, we may see signs of fetal distress, and if we don't intervene quickly, then we could have poor outcomes as far as the fetus. Vaginal bleeding occurs in about 80% of the cases. So real good indicator that maybe something's going on that shouldn't be. Again, abdominal back pain, fetal distress. Um, if I've got vaginal bleeding, clearly I've got fetal distress because things are not going where they should be. Preterm labor. And one of the things that we will see with a placenta abruption, even, whether it's partial or complete. If it's partial and we've monitored them for six hours and they go home and it wasn't picked up or it, it, they can be, it can be a delayed onset, they'll develop DIC within 48 hours. So, you know, we all like, oh, we're gonna monitor for six hours and then two days later there's an abruption and mom goes into DIC and then the whole thing changes. The other thing that we see very, very rarely is uterine rupture. If you think about the uterus, what's its job? It's elastic, it's stretchy, it grows, it's expanding. So it's really, really hard to do damage to the uterus. So if that uterus is ruptured, there's been significant compression and significant um, mechanism. The only caveat to that is if mom has had a C-section because we've disrupted the integrity of that um, organ. But what we'll see, it does have an extreme, it, while it's uncommon, it has an extremely high mortality rate. Not only for mom, but clearly for babe. Sudden sharp pain, vaginal bleeding, asymmetrical abdomen. That nice round symmetrical abdomen is not where it should be. And if you palpate, you may or may not be able to feel baby not where it's supposed to be. Um, and then you'll also lose your fetal heart tones. Unfortunately for this, the treatment really is emergency C-section and hysterectomy, and like I said, poor outcomes, especially with baby, um, because of the fact it's, the uterus has lost its integrity. Fetal injury. Um, prematurity and low birth weight, clearly if they're born early, but what I found was interesting in the literature is the top two are often seen as a result of PTSD in mom, even if there's no or minor injuries. So the stress that affects mom, even if she's in a minor fender bender, will ultimately affect the baby down the line. Um, we know that as the uterus grows, baby's more predisposed to injury, and depending on the gestational age, there's, they've seen skull fractures, intracranial hemorrhages, um, long bone fractures, and then of course there's always the potential for death, um, especially if it's penetrating trauma to the abdomen. Maternal fetal demise. Um, this is always a touchy subject. Um, head injury and hemorrhagic shock is the most common cause of death in, in, in the pregnant patient. Um, major trauma is associated with 40 to 50 percent risk of, law, of fetal loss and increases to 80 percent with mort mortality with mom's mom not doing not making it. So the the 
Big take home here is quicker is better. We want to contain, continue to do CPR. And if the fetus is going to be delivered, resuscitation must continue. And it's estimated that the section should be started within five minutes of arrest with delivery within, or section within four minutes of arrest with delivery within five. So really, it's got to be mom comes in with signs of life, crashes in front of you, and you grab somebody other than me, grabs that knife and makes that incision. Um, and we're not talking the pretty bikini cut here. We're talking get that baby out. Um, because we want, if we're going to have any success, it's going to be rapid. So we're going to talk a little bit briefly about some pitfalls. Um, and if you look at this, this is where we get ourselves into trouble. Hematocrat, normal person, 35 to 45. Pregnant, 28 to 40. Um, RBCs drop. White blood count actually goes up. Um, PT and PT times are shortened. Um, you know, and some of the things we have to think about is TBI versus eclampsia. A traumatic brain injury, we can have seizures. We can have altered mental status. We can have hypertension. We can have protein in the urine. So with the, with the eclampsia, we'll get the protein in the urine, but we'll also get the seizures. So is the patient got a brain injury or are they preeclamptic? So that goes back to our history. Some of the diagnostics. Continue to do your x-rays. Keep in mind you've got babe on board, but the amount of radiation is going to be minimal. Um, so weigh it. Additional blood work. We're going to get our beta HCG um, because we want to know if they're pregnant. Um, we're going to get our Kleinhauer Beck K test or our KB because that's going to detect for those fetal red blood cells in mom. It does indicate hemorrhage in the fetal blood crossing the placenta. This is important when we're talking RH because if mom's RH negative, babe's RH positive, we have a negative outcome, then we're going to have to think about that. Um, and also the levels of fibrinogen and other cl clotting factors increase, so we talked about that. Ultrasound, okay. Ultrasound is important, oops, sorry. And then frequent, frequent reassessment. So going back to our case study. 36 week pregnant patient, motor vehicle crash, vitals there, abdominal pain, was she restrained? And how was she restrained? Are these vitals a concern? Maybe, maybe not. She looks pretty stable right now. We talked about additional details that we'll want to get and the crash related to the restraint. So what are our restrictive priorities? They remain the same. What would be our considered possible injuries, our diagnosis, our diagnostic procedures and disposition? Priorities remain the same, best outcome based on mom. Any questions?